Right, welcome back to another video. Uh, today we're going to be carrying on with our blueprint series and we'll be looking at timelines. Um, so, timelines are a way we can do animation inside of a blueprint. So far we've kind of done some very simple animations using uh, just a simple looped delay, um, such as here, where we were just kind of going around, um, turning things on and off. And we also did a very similar thing, uh, rather than using a loop, but using an event to do that loop um, uh, in the last video. So this time we're going to do a more complex animation, uh, and we're just going to start with a brand new blueprint. And I'm going to call it PP Timeline. Um, so in this example, I'm just going to start with a static mesh. Uh, in this case, it's going to be a chair. It's the default chair from the starter content. Uh, and we're just going to make that move and animate um, using a timeline. So we're not going to do anything with the construction script. It's all going to be animation during gameplay, so we just want those event graph. Uh, and I'm just going to get rid of the ghost nodes and start with a timeline. So this is the node that does animation. So we'll just add a timeline here right at the bottom. Uh, this is going to do things with the chair. So I'm going to give it a name, chair mover. It doesn't really matter what the name is, something that makes sense. Um, and we can see uh, our timeline node. So um, looking at the node itself first, uh, we've got down the left hand side here are sort of playback controls. Uh, hopefully these are pretty self-explanatory from the name. So we've got play and stop, reverse, and then play from start and reverse from end. So if we were opening and closing the door using a timeline, we'd start with play and then we'd stop at the end or it could automatically stop uh, and then reverse would kind of go backwards from that time. Uh, but if we were doing something where we wanted to play from the start every time, we could use that as our input. Uh, you also have the ability to set a specific time, and we might use that a bit later on, um, and what the new time is there. So the way a, a timeline works is every frame, it will run uh, all the code that's in the update pin. Uh, so every frame will happen here, a bit like a loop, uh, which we looked at before. Uh, and then at the end of the timeline, it'll run the finished pin. Um, I don't think I mentioned this last time, but if we actually have a look at some loops, uh, either a for loop or a for each loop. That also has a completed pin. Not sure why it's finished and completed, but it's fine. Uh, and this will run after the loop has finished. Um, it's a little thing from last week as well. Uh, this is cool, uh, but if we double click it and open it up, we can actually get inside the timeline. Uh, and there's different tracks we can add to our timeline. So we're just going to start with a float track, uh, which is over here. And I'm going to call this rotation, and I'm using it to rotate my chair. Um, so this is a float track, floating point values, anything with a decimal, 3.5, something like that. Uh, and we can um, add keyframes to this. It's just a curve editor, just a graph editor, um, very similar to other animation tools you might have used, sequencer, Maya, etc. Um, at the top, we have the length. So the default length is five seconds. So if we scale that back to three, uh, we can change the how long our timeline loop is going to be. Uh, and we'll start, we'll use three seconds for now, just as a sort of preview. Uh, shift click to add keyframes to our timeline and then if we right click we can get the uh, interpolation to different tangents. Uh, in this case I'm just going to keep using linear um, and the keyboard shortcuts for that are the number keys so one to six there. Just delete those two. Very simple animation. Time zero, value zero uh, and then time three uh, a value, let's say, of 360. Uh, I'm going to do rotation, so I'm going to do 360 degrees and rotate my chair around. Now at the top here, we've got options for autoplay and loop. And if we turn those on, we get this little symbol here um, that shows us that that's autoplaying and looping. Uh, so we don't have to jump in to see that that's doing that. Uh, and we'll leave them on for now and we'll use them, but I might change autoplay a bit later on and we'll see why um, when we get there. So this is cool. This is our uh, our chair, our timeline kind of graph bit done. Uh, now we need to actually tell the, the chair to use this rotation value. So uh, you'll notice as I've added that track, I've added a, uh, a new pin. Uh, and this is the number. So as the timeline's playing, the number that we've got in our graph is pushed through into this node or this pin. Um, and then we can use it in the rest of our code. So if I bring in a reference to the chair, all I'm going to do is set rotation. And I'm going to do it relative, and that means relative to the parent. Well, the parent in this case is the default scene root, and so that just means it's kind of local to the uh, to the blueprint. Um, 
And so on, on update, I want to set the relative rotation. And in this case, I'm not using a full rotation. I'm just using a single value. So if I split this, and I can rotate my chair around the Z axis, which will be the, the vertical. And we'll create a spinning chair like that, hopefully. So in the event event graph, rotation into rotation Z. Now we could drop into the world and have a look, but in this case, we can also just go to our viewpoint here uh, and simulate. And um, we'll simulate the the, blo the blueprint locally uh, here, which I mean is maybe a little bit easier uh, in this case. And we've done it, right? We've got on here. If I go up and set the debug, ah, that doesn't work with simulation. Okay, well let's actually put this one of these in the world and do it that way. So if I drop one of these in here and then let's rotate it to face me. Oops, not delete it. If I click play or simulate, it's going to go in and do that rotation. And if I open up my blueprint, now, because I'm actually playing the game, it's picked up that in the uh, in the debug. Uh, let's just put screen. Uh, in the debug filter, it's picked up that blueprint, and we can see what's happening, and it's just running through. Uh, if you mouse over any value, um, you can see in the tooltip, it says here uh, what the current value is. And if you right-click, you can also add what's called a watch, and that will add it to the, um, to the UI. Uh, which can be really useful for debugging your values. And we can see here what's happening. It's starting at zero and it's going up to 360, setting our rotation, and we're getting our spinning chair uh, in our viewport over here. Cool. So that is basically how we use a timeline. So there's a bunch more uh, little features. Um, inside, we have other different tracks. So this was a uh, float track, so just a single value um, going from in this case 0 to 360, we can add a vector track um, and this will give us x, y and z. So if you wanted to animate your position in three different axes, you could do that uh, as such. Um, and you can add obviously keyframes and tangents there. Um, we can also have a color track. So a color track will give us animation of colors. So you could animate a color via a vector, but we can also animate color directly as a float 4 uh, where we get RGB at the top and alpha at the bottom uh, and we can set that or opacity it's called here um, which is pretty cool all work exactly the same way so now if I look I'm gonna have uh, three pins one called rotation one called vector and one just called new track two uh, and if we go back here we can see that and they're color coded by type so the color is blue uh, the vector is sort of red is that red yeah they're color coded um, useful if you're not colorblind. But um, lastly, we have the event track. Uh, so the event track is slightly different. Uh, in which case, uh, or with the event track, we still add keyframes to it, but the position of the keyframe no longer matters. Uh, it's just a sort of point in time. And what this will do will allow us to have events, uh, so we can pull off other bits of code that happen at this time. So if I take my chair asset again, uh, I'm going to do just a toggle visibility. So if it is at visible, it'll become invisible. If it is invisible, it'll become visible. Uh, and then that will just trigger off every time the event track gets hit uh, in the timeline. And so we now have a blinking in and out rotating chair, uh, if we so wanted. Um, yeah, not so useful. But event tracks in general, very, very useful uh, to be able to sort of trigger things on and off uh, or trigger off bits of code. Um, I might just remove that for now. Uh, no, we'll leave it on. We'll leave it on. It's fine. Um, so this all works. Uh, no, nothing wrong with uh, with animating and um, using our timeline tracks like this. One thing I would say, what I tend to do, uh, rather than animating with vectors or animating with colors, um, I would animate with lerps. Uh, and so here we've got a rotation. My rotation is going from zero to three sixty. Well, if I set this back down to one and just animate 0 to 1, uh, I would then take my event graph and use that 0 to 1 value and use a lerp here to, to choose that to go from 0 to 360 here. So mathematically, we're doing the exact same thing. So what's the big advantage of this? Well, I've now got a value here as the sort of my animation value, and I can use that to drive multiple things. So quite often, you're driving the rotation of your object. You might also be driving the color at the same time, or let's say, I don't know, 
the Z height um, world position add world offset. Uh, nope, that's not what I want. Set location, get the right one. So I'm going to do set relative location. And so I'm going to chain these nodes together and split this. And I'm also going to set the Z height using a different lap, but using the same animation pin. So this is no longer really rotation. We should probably rename that. I'm just going to call it animation. Right, rename. And so all my, all my animations are going to go from 0 to 1. And all I'm animating, all I'm worried about with the animation is kind of the curves and the tangents. And then externally to the timeline, I have a um, set of lerps which are controlling sort of the maximum and minimum values. And what's good about this workflow is I can promote these out to variables and control them elsewhere or locally on the blueprint, as we've seen before. So now my maximum height, if I just close this down, this is now controlled on the blueprint itself. And so I can have one here that's say 500, and one here that's say 250, and one here that's like, I don't know, put that to zero and then it won't go anywhere. And so I've kind of extended the, uh, the functionality of the blueprint um, by separating the animation in the timeline from the um, the parameter values through that lerp. Um, not necessary to work that way. Um, obviously, if you're just doing a simple animation, in the case of a rotating object, you can just set 0 to 360. It's probably fine. Um, but quite nice to be able to have that control, I find, as well, um, to get a bit more um, usability or functionality out of your timeline animations. Similarly, if we look at this, they're all starting in the exact same place. Um, Maybe that's fine. If you did have a, a sort of a corridor with a row of ceiling fans, you wouldn't want them all to start spinning uh, at the same orientation. That might look a little strange. So we can also set a, uh, a random start frame. Now we need to do a little bit of code for this manually. There's no option. Um, might be something that could be useful just to have as a, a checkbox here. Uh, and to do that, we're going to disable autoplay because we're not going to want it to start at the start of the game. We're going to want it to start after we've randomized the start frame. And so all we're going to do now, because we've turned off autoplay, we need to have a begin play. And then this will start our uh, timeline playing off. And all I'm going to do is set this random time. So I'm going to use a new node called a sequence. Uh, sequence node, all it does is it runs everything in pin 0, and then everything in pin 1, and then everything in, in whatever many pins you want. So it's just a way of, sort of organizing our, our code. Um, and in this case, first thing I want to do is set a new time. Second thing I want to then do is play. Um, the other two pins aren't going to do anything for now. Well, what new time do you want to set? Well, we want to set a random time between uh, 0 and 3. Um, so if I do a random float in range, I can just say 0 to 3, set that new time. And so what's going to happen now is the first time, well, we're going to quit the game. This is going to run. This is going to set the new time to be somewhere between 0 and 3. Then it's going to start playing, and it's going to carry on looping. And we're going to be setting our uh, heights and uh, rotations. Um, if I compile that and quit the game, we can see now we get a different random start frame um, for each of those rotations, which is really cool, really useful. Uh, anything else I want to do with a timeline? That's pretty it. Um, you can also load in external curves. So you can have a curve assets if you have a set of animation that you want to use a lot. Um, so if you had kind of, yeah, very specific animation and you wanted to share it around, you could save that as a particular curve asset, um, which is quite useful. Uh, and then we've got also this thing here, use last keyframe. So if we turn off the loop uh, and we don't have use, cast, use last keyframe set, um, they're going to just play around and stop. Um, if we change this, uh, use last keyframe overwrites the length. So if I then move this to here, two and a half seconds, use last keyframe, the length here isn't being used anymore. It's this value here, two and a half seconds. So if I think if I just put that up to five, that should now take twice as long um, to play. And you can see the animations now playing slower. So um, a nice feature 
uh, if you do have sort of variable lengths you don't have to fix the length in there but not one I use personally very much uh, replicated allows it to replicate over multiplayer uh, and ignore time dilation so you could have the, um, the the animation ignoring any time dilation you might be using but um, and that's it for um, for these options up there very powerful very useful um, definitely a really good way to do some animations. One slight caveat with it is you can only ever see the animation playing in uh, in play. So there's no good way to preview this. So if you're making kind of like a, a long animation, five minutes, anything like that, you might be better, excuse me, might be better off using a uh, sequencer instead. So, um, but definitely a nice tool to have a uh, toolkit in our toolkit. Right, oh, well, thanks very much for joining me. Um, Thanks always to my patrons uh, for supporting the channel. Uh, if you do have any questions or comments uh, or anything you'd like to see, then do let me know, uh, and I'll see you all next time.